The one warning. Test. Can you guys hear me? Y'all hear me? Settle down. Where are you going, Bessie? <laughs> Skipping out on me. Called her out, didn't I? <laughs> Let's, there you go. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, Lord, we thank you for the many blessings of this life, and we thank you for this privilege that we have each and every week to come in here and Grow a little closer to you through your word and this wonderful study, the book of Revelation. And Father, uh, it's a difficult book to understand on, on, a, on a good day. So Lord, we're going to rely on your Holy Spirit to open up our hearts and our minds and let us receive this message, Lord, and help us to get a good grip on it, especially in the day and age that we live in. Father, I just thank you for this group of believers. I thank you for this church that you've given us. And Lord, we just want to be a church to pleases you, that glorifies your son Jesus, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. All right, now we're going to continue in our study, we're going to talk about chapter 7, and this is one of what many scholars call a parenthesis, where, you know, take a minute to give us some more information that's pertinent to what's going on in the tribulation period. Uh, another Another way to describe that is you know, an interlude. Uh, you know, they could be described in both ways. But anyway, John starts this, you know, very quickly, you know, because I know a lot of people are, are kind of hit and miss and haven't been able to keep up. So, uh, you know, very quickly, John has this vision. He's in the island of Patmos. He's exiled for preaching the gospel. And he has this vision, and he sees the glorified Christ. Glorified Christ tells him to write Seven letters to existing churches in Asia Minor, basically speaking to the condition that they are, and we talked about that in great detail. Some of them were doing things well, and he commends them for that. Some, he was, you know, were not doing things well, and he rebukes them and tells them they need to get things right while they still can, okay? Well, then we get to chapter 4, chapter 5. Chapter 4 is very interesting because... The first thing we see is he hears a voice, says, come on up here, let me show you what may, must take place now. Many believe, I myself agree, that that's symbolic of the rapture of church. It really is not important, but we do know that from that point on, we don't see the church mentioned again or implied until chapter 19, okay? Now, let me point out, chapter 19, 20, 21, 22 will be, the tribulation period will be over. We'll be talking about the... Uh, Millennial Kingdom and the New Jerusalem and, you know, really good stuff, the streets of gold and that sort of thing. And also, let me also point out, when you get to chapter 7, you know, we're taking a break from judgment. What we're seeing in full display is God's grace, okay? How, how gracious and merciful God is that he still gives a path to salvation, even for those in the tribulation period. Now, anyway, chapters 4 and chapter 5, we spend talking about the throne room. We went into great detail there. We see all the main characters. We see there's 24 elders who represent, represent the rapture church, which is very important, meaning represent us. We will be there, okay? We saw the four living creatures. We saw the uh, Holy Spirit was there. And then, of course, we see the Father on the throne, and we see the Lamb in chapter 5 looking as if he was slain, which was representative of what Jesus did when he was slain when he was crucified on the cross, okay? Well, the lamb is the star of this show. We see, I think I said the lamb is mentioned some 40 times throughout the book of uh, Revelation. Well, anyway, in chapter 6, which is where we were last week, basically, you know, we like to say it's on now. It's on now because that's the beginning of the tribulation period and the first horse that rides out is the white horse, which we recognize as the Antichrist. Okay? Now, he has a bow, but he has no arrows. That means that he is a political leader. 
He's going to have a lot of answers to the world's vast problems. That's how he comes into power. Now, there's so much more to talk about with the Antichrist, and we'll probably revisit him in great detail. We'll have to in chapter 13 of Revelation when, you know, we see the beast comes up out of the sea, okay? That would be the Antichrist. But let me also mention, last week we went into great detail about how the Olivet Discourse, how Daniel's visions that took place some 650, 675 years before John has his visions, and Paul, in his two letters to the church at Thessalonica, all of them are in pretty much harmony and agreement, and they all paint a picture of how things are going to go down. And we went into great detail explaining that. Very interesting stuff. Might be a little confusing, but it's very interesting, especially when you look at the Olivet Discourse and you see how much, you know, that coincides with what takes place in the tribulation period. Now, like I said, that first horse is the Antichrist white horse. Well, the second horse rides out, and that's the red horse, and that's the horse of war. Now, if you go over to Olivet Discourse, Jesus says, you know, there will be wars and rumors of wars. That's what he's talking about. So this is the beginning of the tribulation period. Now, basically, that peace that the Antichrist establishes doesn't last very long, and he effectively stirs things up, and now immediately we have wars. Well, wars have a lot of byproducts. We see that third horse is a black horse. That's the horse of famine, which is a byproduct of what happens in a lot of wars, especially wars on the scales we're talking about. We're talking about civil wars. We're talking about racial wars. We're talking about traditional wars. We're going to have all kinds of upheaval during this particular time, and that's going to create a lot of havoc, and one of the byproducts of that is going to be a great famine, okay? But notice we talked about how the food supply, you know, you will have to spend a day's worth of wages just to get enough to eat in a day. So the economy is really going to tank. Now, this is stuff that we worry about right now. We see a lot of these things. So it's easy to say, okay, it might be 500 years before the Lord comes back. We don't know, which is by design, by divine design, because he wants us to stay ready. If we knew, we might decide to get slack. But anyway, we don't know, but we can easily look around and we can see what we see on the headlines of the news. We can see the food chain and the issues that we potentially have. We can see the bad, uh, the bad crops that are produced in the Midwest because of drought. We can see the fires raging. We can see the wars and rumors of wars over there in Ukraine and Israel. We see all these things, and it doesn't take a lot to imagine that we could very well be on the doorstep, okay? Now, let me remind you, as we talked about last week, the Antichrist, basically the tribulation period begins when the Antichrist signs a seven-year peace treaty with Israel, basically offering them some protection. Now, you look around in the last year, do you think Israel would ever be, would that would ever be attractive to Israel, that they would sign a peace treaty and get all these people off of them? Everything that they're dealing with, they got wars on three or four fronts over there, right? They've always been persecuted. But, you know, in the last year, it's the most I've ever seen in my lifetime, okay? So it doesn't take much to see that this could very well be at the doorstep of, you know, what we're looking at. All the more reason to get ready. Now, that fourth horse is a pale horse. Now, that's the result of sword and famine and plague. And after that pale horse rides out, Get this, 1.75 billion people have lost their lives at that point, which is about a quarter of the population as it exists today. 1.75 billion, maybe closer to 2 billion. Anyway, Jesus says that these are the beginning of birth pains. Okay, in other words, it just got started. The tribulation period just got started. When you see wars and rumors of wars, Jesus says it's just getting started. Now, we still have the trumpet judgments. We still have the bold judgments. Now, the fifth seal, that is open, and we see the martyrs, the tribulation saints, are under the altar. That sixth seal, we see a major earthquake, such a powerful earthquake that the mountains are moved from their place. And we see all the people of the earth, all the unbelievers, all the sinful humanity who have turned their backs on God, they're trying to die. They would rather die because they didn't want to face the wrath of the Lamb. Okay? So we're talking about bad stuff. But anyway, here in chapter 7, 
we're starting to see how a great revival is going to take place in the tribulation period. We're going to see how that happens. Now, we're going to talk about two groups. We're going to talk about the 144,000 spirit-filled Jews. Now, let me remind you that if we have 144,000 spirit-filled Jews and they're spreading the gospel message throughout the world, which is what we're going to talk about, you know, that's basically what do you think the 12 spirit-filled Jews, meaning the disciples, did to, to, to spread the gospel message and look what they did. So it's going to be a powerful revival. Now, we're also going to talk about the tribulation saints, which effectively, for the most part, will be the converts of these 144,000 evangelists, okay, all in this chapter, Jews and Gentiles alike. Now, Revelation chapter 7, verse 1. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from the, all the tribes of Israel. Now we have these four angels, and they're holding back four winds. Now, winds in the Old Testament often meant judgment, okay? So they're holding back the four winds of judgment from the earth at this time. Now, when he says four corners, we know that the earth is not flat, so he's basically speaking to the four points of the compass, north, south, east, and west, okay? Four corners. Now, basically what we're seeing is we're reminded that God, even though everything seems to be going downhill rapidly, God is still in control, you know, even when it doesn't look like it. He has limits on what he will allow. Now, if, you know, just for more understanding of that, we know that the book of Job starts out with Satan is roaming to and from throughout the world, throughout the earth, and he approaches God, and he says, you know, I want to test your servant Job, okay? Well, he has to get permission from God before he can do that. Nothing happens unless God at least allows it. So evidently, you know, he allows the Antichrist to ride out at this particular time. Remember that restraining force that we talked about, the Holy Spirit, that will be removed and, and the function of the Holy Spirit will change after the church is raptured. Well, the Holy Spirit is restraining evil at this particular time right now as we speak. Now, if you don't think that's the case, why do you think we're still here and we haven't endured some of those things that we're so concerned about? How about cyber warfare? You know, we've been talking about they could take our lights out in New York City for a long time, right? What do you think is restraining that evil from taking place? I mean, everybody, you know, every hacker in the world sitting in a Hotel 6, you know, can, you know, do, do a number. I mean, that technology's out there, and sometimes I wonder why it's not taking place yet. Well, the Holy Spirit, you know, God has decided it's not time for it to take place yet. But at this particular time, the Holy Spirit is going to be removed with the church. He's still going to be here, but his role is going to change, and he is not going to be restraining evil as he is today. And we talked about that. Now, basically, God is not ready to release anything else at this point. So he tells these four angels, hold off on these four winds of judgment because I have to mark my people. Okay, that's what he's saying. Now, when you're talking about marking people, what they're talking about is, you know, back in that day is all the kings would have a ring with a special insignia, and once they put that mark, you know, it would signify ownership and protection. That's what they're talking about. Now, it was also very common when you see foreheads here that slaves would receive that mark on their forehead, which basically, once again, would say that, you know, it would signify ownership and protection. So what we're seeing here with God is God is saying, I'm going to seal my people, these 144,000 spirit-filled Jews, and I'm going to, you know, they're going to basically belong to me, and I am going to protect them throughout the tribulation period, which he does. Now, this is a remnant. God always leaves a remnant. These are 144,000 spirit-filled Jews, also referred to as 144,000 evangelists who are going to crisscross the world and spread the gospel message during the tribulation period, okay? 
Now, there's more to come. But first of all, you know that we are also, as believers, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit, guaranteeing what is to come. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Now you look over to 2 Corinthians, something very similar, 121. Now it is God who makes both of us and you stand firm in Christ. He anoints us, sets his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Okay? When we accept Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit, so God is effectively putting his seal of ownership in our hearts at a moment of conversion. Now, it basically speaks to eternal security. Now, there's a lot more to go on that, but that's not our purpose tonight. Now, the bottom line is God is going to protect this 144,000 throughout the tribulation period. No one will be able to touch them. God's calamities, you know, the earthquakes and the things that we're going to see, that's not going to be able to touch them either. He's going to protect them from that, and he's going to protect them from the Antichrist and everything he's going to do. Nobody will be able to touch these 144,000. Now, when you talk about preaching the gospel message, you look over to all of the discourse, you see that again. What did Jesus say? He said in verse 14 of chapter 24 of Matthew, he says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. That's what he's talking about, these 144,000. Now, if you look over there at Revelation chapter 7, verse 5. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulon, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. From the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000. Now, these are the 12 tribes, okay, a variation, but it's not the same list that you see earlier in the Bible. It's a different list. It's altered slightly. But first of all, there's not a Jew alive today that knows what tribe he's in because they used to keep, you know, extensive records up until A.D. 70 when Jerusalem was destroyed. So all those records were destroyed. So there's not a Jew that knows what tribe he, he belongs to, but that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is God knows. Now, note that Judah is first here. Now, that's not normal. You know, normally Reuben would be listed first, but Reuben, you know, committed adultery with uh, his father's concubine, so he's basically forfeited his place. Now, Judah, obviously, you know, what's the significance of Judah? We should know that. The line of the tribe of Judah, what does that mean? That's the tribe that Christ comes from. So it makes sense that Judah would be listed first. Now, Joseph is usually omitted from these lists. He has two sons, okay? He has Manasseh and Ephraim. They are usually placed there, but Joseph is omitted. Well, here we see that he's there, but Ephraim is not, okay? Ephraim was caught up in idolatry, which explains that. Dan is missing. He's usually part of this list. Now, he was also called in idolatry. And then we see Levi. Now, Levi is not usually a part of this list. Levi does not have an inheritance. They won't receive any land. That's because this is the priestly tribe. This is the tribe that Moses and Aaron came out of. This is the priestly tribe. But anyway, if you're talking about ministry, in the ministry of the 144,000, it would make absolute sense that Levi would be a part of this, right? Now, some try to say, some scholars try to say that this is all symbolic. Well, you know, there's way too much detail for this to be symbolic. This is literal. This is, you know, God raises up this 144,000 12,000 from each of these tribes. Now, one of the things that you probably are thinking, or you should be thinking, is when you think of the 144,000, you think of, you know, Jehovah Witness. Now, that's because Jehovah Witness, believe it or not, 
You know, I don't understand everything about Jehovah Witness, but Jehovah Witness believe that only 144,000 will ever get to heaven. Now, one thing that I don't understand is they're knocking on as many doors as they can. If I was them and I truly believe 144,000 get to heaven, I'd keep it a secret, wouldn't you? Okay? i say, I don't want them to know, you know. If only 144,000 of us are going to go there, we don't need to tell anybody, right? I don't understand that. But I know, you know, Jehovah Witnesses have a lot of beliefs that, you know, for one thing, they believe that my, uh, Jesus is like the Archangel Michael, and we know that's not true, Okay? But anyway, the purpose, let me remind you, is God is judging the unbelieving world, and he's also keeping his promise to Israel. Now, God still has plans for Israel. Now, Israel, you know, they rejected Christ as a nation. They put Jesus on the cross, and, you know, there were, uh, there were Jews that accepted Christ. The disciples are the, the prime example of that. And there have been Jews that have accepted Christ all along. But Israel as a nation has been promised that it would be redeemed, but it has yet to be, you know, accept Christ, right? They don't believe that Jesus came. Now, Romans chapter 11, verse 25. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. Now the point is, these 144,000 spirit-filled Jews are the quote-unquote first fruits of that redemption for Israel. They're the first fruits. Now they accepted Christ, that's how they get the spirit, and then they become spirit-filled Jews. Now if you look over there to Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, it says, and I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. In other words, they will accept Christ. Now those alive during the tribulation period. Now later... When the two witnesses are resurrected, and we'll get into that in a couple of chapters, there's a great earthquake that takes place. Now, if you look over to Revelation chapter 11, verse 13, at that very hour, there was a severe earthquake, and a tenth of the city collapsed. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. That's the rest of Israel. And after they see those two witnesses who were dead lying streets for three and a half days resurrected in that great earthquake, they become believers, and that's the point where Israel is completely saved, those that are alive during the tribulation period. Now, like I said, now the 144,000, they're on... That, that scene takes place on earth. Remember I told you we're going to go back and forth from earth to heaven. Now... Now he's back in heaven when you look over there at verse 9. This is a vision that he sees in heaven. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, speaking before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. Now it's a great multitude, once again, no one can count, and they're from all over the world. They're all racist, all nations. They're, every, you know, represented from everybody. Now they're standing in front of the throne and in front of the Lamb. They're wearing white robes, which means they have been perfected by their faith in Christ. They've been glorified, uh, and they've received the righteousness of Christ when they accepted Him. So everything's done through Christ, but basically they're glorified. They're wearing righteous clothes, and they're holding palm branches. Now, that speaks to when they celebrate the Jews, the Feast of the Tabernacle, and, you know, they would wave palm branches, which is a form of celebration. They were celebrating deliverance from Egypt. Well, here they're celebrating deliverance from the tribulation period. Now, Revelation chapter 7, verse 10, And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne, around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom 
and thanks and honor and power and strength to our God forever and ever. Amen. Now they're praising God for salvation. Now all the angels, the four living creatures, the elders, they're all gathered around. And basically these multitude, these tribulation saints we're getting ready to find, basically have a very special place in heaven because of what they've been through. Now here's where we find out in verse 13 it says, Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Now this elder asked John, which you know the elder knows, so basically he's asking John so John will know. It looks like John is stunned by what he sees. And he says, who are they? Well, they're the tribulation saints. They're those that came to Christ and died for Christ during the seven-year tribulation period. Now, keep in mind, you know, these are converts of, you know, largely converts of the 144,000. That's their fruit, okay? They will be Jews and Gentiles alike. So both the first part of chapter 7 and the last part are intertwined to some degree. Now, like I said, day and night in his heavenly temple. Now, the temple will be rebuilt. You know, the temple was destroyed in A.D. 70. It's been destroyed a long time. It will be rebuilt, the earthly temple in Jerusalem, during tribulation period, but this is not what he's talking about. He's referring to the heavenly temple, which basically, in effect, is his presence, God's presence. Now, the bottom line, like I said, they have a very special place in God's heart. They paid the ultimate price. And he says, God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Now, basically, going to comfort them throughout eternity. Now, that speaks to the tremendous hope we have as believers. Now, like I said, this is a picture of God's grace. That's what, you know, even though we have judgment, even though God has poured out his wrath on sinful humanity in tribulation period, God's still full of mercy and grace. And those who have not rejected Christ, in other words, have not received that delusional spirit and followed the Antichrist and have their hearts hardened so they can't, you know, accept Christ. Those who have not done that, many will come to Christ during the tribulation period, and those are referred to as tribulation saints. That's, so there's a tremendous revival that takes place. Now, I know I throw a lot at you, but, you know, one of the things that, you know, the highlight here is God is still full of mercy and grace. Now, when I look at this, and I think to myself, you know, if I could bear my soul a little bit, you know, Sunday when we talked about um, being faithful, and we talked about, you know, the parable of the talents, and how the person with one talent buried their talent, and, you know, and then, you know, he thought he could justify not doing anything, and, you know, the master came back and said he was lazy and he was wicked. And, you know, that's pretty clear what the Lord thinks about, you know, what he gives you as far as the resources to use, what he expects from you. Now, the one talent, when I see that, you know, I almost see that as an average person. In other words, that particular person didn't have a lot, but they were expected to put it to work for the kingdom, right? And they decided not to. Well, that describes a lot of professed believers. You see what I'm saying? Now, the reason I said that, that's part of the Olivet Discourse. That's chapter 25. That's when Jesus basically, after chapter 24, he goes to chapter 25, and he gives two important parables. The parable of the ten virgins, which is keeping their oil you know, lamps lit and ready, and then the parable of the talents, which means whatever God's given you, whatever resources he's given you, you need to be working using them for his glory. Okay? Now, getting back to that and getting back to the tribulation period and what we're discussing here, the point is we make the decision whether we're going to take God's word seriously or not. I don't know how many times people have heard that message about the parable of the talent and completely ignored it and went back to living for themselves. I mean, you know, 
And it's clearly saying don't go living for yourself. God's given you things and you need to make it all available for his glory because he's coming back and he's going to hold you to account. You see what I'm saying? How can people see that? I guess you don't really believe the Bible if you go back to living in a way that displeases God when you do that, do you? Is there another explanation? Because it's pretty clear. Anybody got any thoughts? Please. Well, you know, when he starts tribulation, when he starts revelation, he immediately, the very first thing he does is he goes and writes those seven churches of Asia Minor and says, hey, guys, this is what you're doing right and this is what you're doing wrong. You know, that's basically a message to believers. You know, I'm giving you time to make the corrections that you need to make while you still can. You see what I'm getting at? And so getting back to chapter 7, you know, the church is already raptured. So, you know, uh, that, that's a done deal for, for believers, for, for us. And anybody that rejected Christ has got that delusional spirit, so their heart is hardened and they won't be able to receive it. But God's still giving the people who haven't heard the message during the tribulation period. He's still got his arm extended in grace, you know, to save them. So God's always trying to save us. He's not trying to you know, judge us, you know, without, you know, his primary goal is he wants us to come to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. And he gives us every opportunity throughout the word. And uh, Sunday was a good example. You know, let me paint it this way. If I'm in those pews or I'm watching from, you know, from home and I see that message and I see that part about, you know, the one talent the guy buried his and I'm not serving the Lord in any way and don't intend to, and I decide to keep on going in that direction, then it's on me. It's on me. You see what I'm saying? I made a decision, very poor decision, and I didn't adjust, you know, when I heard the word of God. You get it? You know? Anybody else got any points? I don't know. The Bible doesn't say, but you got to assume that if people are going to accept Christ, then the Holy Spirit's going to have to indwell in them. So the Holy Spirit's going to have to be here. But his role's going to change. You know, he's not, no longer the, the church was going to be raptured, and the Holy Spirit's not going to be, you know, that restraining force. That will be removed. But he'll still be there because I don't see how else, you know, that people can be saved without the Holy Spirit. But the Bible is not clear. Kenny, you got any thoughts on that? Put you on the spot. Now, you weren't sleeping, were you? No. I got a few different views, but. Okay. Like you said, I don't, I don't want to argue with them for a discussion of the Okay. I think the Holy Spirit, I think this, this happens between the 6th and 7th, uh, back in the 6th chapter, mm-hmm. where war's getting ready to be done. Mm hmm. The, uh, the winds are, are wars that's going to take place all over the world, coming all over, which we see that happen. Then we see, uh, in this to me, God says, wait a minute, before you let that last horse go, I'm going to bring peace, I'm going to bring protection. I think all that comes from God. Um, Holy Spirit, yeah, but I believe. Of God is the Holy Spirit. But I believe that comes uh, nothing that we unite, but it's God's coming. Uh, it's nothing we can do or people can do at that time. It's what God is going to do because He knows their hearts. So He's going to seal those who knows their hearts. All right. And, uh, uh, yeah. It's time of peace. It's going to be a, uh, going to be protected. Well, it's interesting. Um, like I said, there's a lot of different views. A lot of people see Revelation in a lot of different ways. And it's okay because it's not taking place yet. There are some people who believe that we're going to be going through the tribulation period. And, Lord, I don't want to believe that. You know, but the thing is the Scripture is very strong. 
that the church will be raptured. So I don't even lose any sleep over that. If you're a believer, you're going to be raptured and you're going to be in heaven when this takes place, which is very comforting. Anybody got anything else? The ones that, who had not accepted Christ, they're they're well, they're in Hades. They're they're in hell, you know, and they will be resurrected at the end of the tribulation period at the great, great white throne of judgment, and then they will be thrown in the lake of fire. Those that have rejected Christ that have died, the Jews, they they they, they also. They have rejected Christ and they're in hell. The Jews that will be saved or will be those that are living at the time of tribulation period. Okay, when he's talking about redeeming Israel, that's who he's talking about. Anybody that's died and rejected Christ at this time, you know, they're they're going to spend eternity separated from God. Jews, Gentiles alike. Uh, So, you know... uh, No, no. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Uh-huh, 144,000. They'll be saved. If anybody that accepts Christ during the tribulation period will be saved. Where you might be getting confused is before the tribulation period, uh, anybody who has rejected Christ. In other words, if you've had the message preached to you and you've rejected Christ, you know, when the Antichrist comes, you will receive a delusional spirit and you will follow him and your heart will be hardened so you won't get a second chance to accept Christ. Your heart will be hardened and you will be under a delusional spirit. But the people who have never heard the gospel message, who have never had the chance to reject Christ during the tribulation period, and many of them will be witnessed to by these 144,000 evangelists and the other two witnesses, you know, they accept Christ. They will be the tribulation saints, and they will, you know, that's who we've been talking about. You know, they will, you know, they might die a martyr's death, but, they, you know, eternity, they'll spend eternity with the Lord. Um, anybody got anything else? It gets more difficult to follow as we go forward, okay? This is pretty straightforward, I think. Well, this, this, yeah. Well, that's a very interesting question, and we don't have a clear answer, but we have strong opinions. First of all, you know, there's a couple scenarios that come to mind. You know, if you accepted Christ and, you know, and it was for real, then you will be saved. However, I can't look at you and tell you if you truly accepted Christ. I can guess that you might not have by the way you're living. I can expect some fruit. But, you know, the thing that I always think about is, you know, the prodigal son. You know, he, he, le- he left and, but, you know, went off and blew his money on wild living. But he was always a son, and he finally came back. And a lot of times, you know, a lot of times even believers might drift away but they're still a believer, but we don't know that they're having any peace about the life that they're living because if you belong to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's going to be working on you. You can resist the Holy Spirit, but eventually, you know, if you're a true believer, you're going to get back to where you need to be, okay? But I can't look at you and tell if you are or not. You see what I'm saying? So I don't get to make that judgment. God knows that. But I can tell you that you're not living in the way, you know, that you need to be in prayer and you need to repent and you need to 
you know, think about, you know, whether you're truly a child of God because uh, it would be evidence. But, you know, like I say, uh, I've seen a lot of people who, you know, they drifted, they were right with the Lord, they drifted away and they came back. And so how do I know that they weren't saved all along? But it is questionable if you're not living for the Lord, were you saved to begin with? That is a legitimate question. It's something that everybody should ask themselves. I believe you, should, you cannot lose your salvation, but you can lose your grace and mercy of the Lord. We walk away from it. But at the same time, do you know that you're saved? As a child growing up, I can be my witness. My whole testimony is this I grew up in the church. I grew up in Sunday. Conviction. And it's like, you know, uh, but people, I believe, can still continually reject the conviction. Resist. Resist it. I guess, you know, if, if you live apart, you know, if you decide to go off and tomorrow and start living for the world and hit the bars and and never pray, never spend time with the Lord and just decide to live for yourself and think you're saved, you might have a problem that might be a sign that you're not, you know. But if you go do and you drift away, but the Lord's working on your heart and you're not getting peace about what you're doing and the life you're living, if you're a believer, you're not going to get peace about it until you get yourself right with the Lord and come back. I believe that's a common occurrence even amongst believers that we drift away, we get sidetracked, we get into the world a little bit, but the Holy Spirit convicts us and works on our heart. That's how we know we belong to God. And eventually, we know the only way we're going to really get any peace is get back where we need to be in our relationship, you know, everything that that entails. However, at the end of the day, this is God's call, because all I can tell you is if you're not living right, you probably need to ask yourself what you really say. But that's the extent of what I can tell you. I can't tell you, if you say that you've accepted Christ, whether you're going to heaven or not, just by looking, because I don't know your heart. Does that make any sense? Okay, but I can tell you, you need to be concerned, you know, for your own salvation if you're not, you know, living out your faith. You need to be concerned about it. You need, it's a legitimate question you need to ask yourself. Is that a good way to say it? Uh, but a great question. Uh, you know, I mean, I think everybody in here is here because the Holy Spirit started working on them at one time and started bringing them back 
and you don't want to get serious about your faith. Okay, I think we're all here because of that reason. So I feel like, you know, that tells you that you're saved. You're, you're not here to impress anybody. I don't see anybody here to impress anybody. I see here people here because the Holy Spirit has drawn them here, and they want to study the book of Revelation, and they want to get right with, stay right with the Lord. Okay? We've all, I also know a lot of you guys in here, and I know that a lot of you have drifted away and lived various ways, you know, but you're back. So that tells me, you know, that the Holy Spirit was in your heart and he was working on you. You probably didn't get a lot of peace about living, you know, outside of the realm of, of God, God's circle of grace. Does that make sense? All right. And I believe you miss you can miss out on an awful lot of blessings. Absolutely. An awful lot of blessings. You know, I've been on both sides. I like it a lot better on this side. All right. Well go ahead and pull your prayer list 